Now before we get started, we want to give a quick thank you to our sponsor, Babbel. One of the biggest setbacks in some of our videos is the lack of English resources in some foreign or overseas cases. So to avoid being restricted to North American cases, we need to be able to understand other languages. And that's where Babbel comes in. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world, with lessons that are designed by real language teachers and are scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in three weeks. With Babbel's focus on real-world conversations, we've been able to refine our speaking skills to understand audio and video in other languages. For example, I haven't been able to practice my French for a very long time, mais avec Babbel, je peux utiliser leur application pratique pour pratiquer ma français chaque jour. And now, with Babbel's Cyber Monday deal, you can click the link in our description box to get 60% off your subscription with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Now, let's get back to the video. On Sunday, August 10th, 1991, in the sleepy town of Martinsburg, West Virginia, a housekeeper entered room 517 of the Sheraton Hotel. Upon knocking and receiving no response, the housekeeper entered the room and wondering where the occupant of the room was, peered past the open door of the bathroom. There, she found smears of blood on the floor. After calling for support in a panic, another maid entered the room, and there in the bathroom, they found the body of Danny Casolaro. If anything happens to me, don't believe it's an accident. According to various sources, this was one of the last things investigative journalist Danny Casolaro had told his brother before he left for West Virginia to chase a lead. Danny's death was tentatively ruled a suicide, but it wasn't long before reports started coming out speculating that Casolaro was murdered and that the case that he had been working on was what got him killed. But as the theories of murder and cover-up grew more and more apparent, two questions became clear. Who was Danny Casolaro, and why do people think his research is what led to his demise? Born in 1947 as the second of six children to an Italian family, Daniel, or Danny Casolaro, was known by his friends and family as the ultimate nice guy with few serious worries. His father, Joe, was well off, being a successful physician and having provided what was seen as a very good life in their hometown of McLean, Virginia. Danny was said to have admired his father, but didn't want to follow in his footsteps. He never took an interest in medicine or medical studies like his father, and to an extent could be called the black sheep of the family, although none of his relatives say that they saw him that way. Throughout childhood, Danny had mixed results in school, sometimes doing good and sometimes bad, but he managed to get by in high school and go to college. By the late 1960s, Danny was attending Providence College and spending most of his time with his soon-to-be wife, Terrell Pace, a fellow student. His friends all remember him favorably. They recall that he was sweet and trusting, the latter may be too much for his own good. He worked hard at staying fit, but certainly drank and pursued women more than he needed to. By all accounts, Casolaro was living well. After leaving college, he had a kid, he was living in a $400,000 home in Fairfax City, and had free reign to explore his different hobbies and lifestyles, the main one being writing. And so, Casolaro took his shot at it. Throughout his early career, Danny had written for various publications, although not many of them earning him the recognition he needed to be successful. His work, as varied as his interests, differed greatly throughout his life. According to his resume, he'd written several small passion projects, like his novel The Ice King, as well as scripts for different movies, also writing for various journals and magazines. But it wasn't until 1976 that Casolaro would establish his position at a company. A company named Computer Age Publications had taken Casolaro in as an associate editor, and in the following years, Danny would work his way up the company, becoming editor-in-chief and even becoming part owner. But even with his small success, Danny wasn't satisfied. He realized the meager pay he was writing for was no longer enough. He needed a new story, something he could lose himself in and dedicate himself to, with the promise of recognition and reward. And so, with that in mind, as well as some tax issues with the IRS, Danny sold a stake in the company that he'd been working for for 13 years to pursue independent writing. Little did Danny know that the next case he would work on would consume the rest of his short life.
While searching for a new gig and asking around for leads, a friend of Danny's pointed him in the direction of a new but growing scandal in the offices of the company INSLAW, or the Institute for Law and Social Research. And so, Danny decided to talk to the founder of the company, William Hamilton, to see what the story was all about. And over the course of a few talks, William Hamilton told Danny the following story. It was 1982, and INSLAW, Hamilton's information technology company, had just been awarded a contract worth nearly $10 million to develop and install their software on the Department of Justice's computers. Up until this point, the DOJ had been using old and outdated methods of tracking criminal cases, most of which were specific to each office, meaning large databases like that of the CIA, IRS, and Attorney General were expansive but could not be shared between offices. That's why William Hamilton developed PROMISE to counteract this problem. PROMISE, which stood for Prosecutor's Management Information System, had the ability to access these databases and integrate them. With the press of a button, you'd be able to find out prior convictions, known associates, status of appeals, and virtually anything you wanted to know. It's safe to say that, at the time, PROMISE's potential was blinding, and the previously mentioned contract was supposed to mark the start of INSAW's very profitable business ventures. Instead, what ensued was years of legal problems between the DOJ and INSLAW, arguments over who owned what version of the software, the DOJ withholding payment, and INSLAW overcharging for their services. Hamilton bitterly explained that this contract, originally intended to pay INSLAW $10 million, eventually drove them to bankruptcy. But this wasn't just a story about how the DOJ screwed over a technology company, although that was part of it. After suing the DOJ, a bankruptcy court ruled in INSLAW's favor and basically claimed that the DOJ was purposefully trying to bankrupt INSLAW. As Danny Casolaro was listening to the story, it seemed to intrigue him. After all, it was about software and computers, something Danny had spent the last decade writing about. But what pushed Danny over the edge was the fantastical claims told by another lead he'd found, a man named Michael Riconosciuto. Michael claimed, and later wrote in a sworn affidavit, that the reason the DOJ wanted to bankrupt INSLA was to steal the promised software from them without having to pay. He claimed that he himself had been hired by a private security firm to modify the promised software so that it could be sold to other countries, as well as create a so-called backdoor that allowed the US to spy on any country that bought the software from them. This story centers on incredible allegations of spying on a scale never before imagined. It involves America's Central Intelligence Agency selling computer programs to foreign nations. These programs allegedly allowed the CIA to spy on the intelligence agencies that bought it. And one of the purchases was Australia. We've been able to track down two key witnesses to those dealings, witnesses who are now in fear of their lives. Shortly after signing an affidavit revealing what he knew, Michael was swiftly arrested on drug charges and remained in prison for 26 years, only being released in 2017. Although Michael's lists of stories and accusations seemed unreal, and Danny, frankly, didn't believe in many of them, it did supply Danny with an endless list of leads that he could follow. And so, just as he'd hoped for, Danny dove headfirst into the rabbit hole, becoming completely immersed in his research. By late 1990, it was said that Danny wouldn't talk about much else. He spent his days trying to make sense of the claims and theories that he'd been told, and even wanted to write a book detailing the elaborate conspiracy that he'd stumbled upon. In fact, Danny had even written a book proposal for a true crime narrative named Behold a Pale Horse. In his notes, he says it's supposed to be a series of articles and a book, all detailing the web of thugs and thieves who roam the earth. Now, he later changed the name to the octopus, symbolizing the many interconnected tentacles or aspects of the conspiracy, but more importantly, he started focusing on a much wider picture of what he was researching. In a rough draft of the book, he writes, This is the story of eight men whose real-life impossible mission intrigues have dominated key events that span the globe for nearly half a century. They are the men who make up the octopus. But what exactly was the octopus? the big conspiracy that Danny had been researching for months, and that the previously mentioned INSLA affair was only part of. Well, according to Danny's notes, the octopus was a small group of powerful men, mostly CIA operatives, that had banded together just after World War II. In his draft of the book, Danny had mentioned eight men in particular, but it's unclear exactly which eight men he meant. Danny theorized that the octopus was created as an anti-communist response to one of their own spies defecting to the Soviet Union 
and ever since, the small team had been working for their own personal gain through assassinations, arms sales, coups, international drug trafficking, and much more. Danny believed that, in the late 1970s, when Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan were campaigning to be the next president, and Iran had taken American diplomats hostage at the U.S. Embassy, that people in the octopus had struck a deal with Iran to delay the release of the hostages until after Reagan had been elected, so that Jimmy Carter couldn't take any credit for their release. In return, the U.S. would covertly break the arms embargo against Iran. And so, only minutes after Reagan had concluded his inaugural speech, the American hostages were sent home. The American Congress, of course, denies this theory, but several high-ranking individuals, including the Iranian president at the time, as well as a naval officer and U.S. National Security Council member, maintain the accusation. Danny also believed that, a few years later, while the war in Nicaragua between the anti-communist Contras and the pro-socialist Sandinistas was raging on, the U.S. had illegally funded the Contras in various ways. At first, U.S. support and aid for the Contras was very publicly known, but when Congress had signed legislation to stop this aid, the CIA had found different, more hidden ways to fund them. Danny believed that, in simple terms, the CIA and people in the octopus's circles were selling drugs and weapons to Iran and using some of the funds to secretly help arm the Contras in Nicaragua. Danny's octopus conspiracy went much further than just these few scandals, but covering them all would take hours, so let's continue with the story. Danny had been researching the octopus for nearly a year at this point, but he was starting to run into some problems. For one, Danny was having financial troubles. A few days before his death, he met with a real estate agent to try and sell some of his property to get income and continue working on his research. One of the people who had talked to Danny in his last days claimed that he spoke of an apparent deal with Time magazine to fund his research and give him an advance, but Time later denied having any contact with Danny. Other friends of Danny claimed that he emphasized the importance of the so-called advance that he was about to get claiming that if he didn't get it, he would have to borrow money from his family again. Second was the claims that Danny was being told to back off from his research. Danny's brother Tony claims that he'd been getting threatening phone calls in the middle of the night for around three months now, and had allegedly been getting threats for looking into certain parts of his investigation, including the place where Michael Riconosciuto claimed he worked on modifying the Promise software in the Indio Reservation in California. Now, people who tried looking into exactly what was going on in that reservation were usually unwelcome, as accusations ranged all the way from arms manufacturing, suspicious casino activities, and ties to the CIA. In the 1980s, Fred Alvarez, a tribal leader at the time, was actively critical about the activities going on there, and not too long later, was found murdered along with his two companions. Now, Danny Casalaro was investigating the same reservation and the same activities, making people around him nervous for his safety. Nevertheless, Danny kept pushing on. Danny's last days were strange to the people who knew him. On August 5th, 1991, five days before he would be found dead, Danny called one of his friends, a retired officer, and told him about the apparent Time Magazine collaboration. This day was also when Danny had told his brother about the threatening phone calls that he was getting in the middle of the night, and peculiarly, Danny had also met with an MSNBC reporter and told her, quote, I just broke the Inslaw case and you can have it. The next day, according to one of his friends, Danny seemed enthusiastic and in very good spirits because of a source he had obtained in West Virginia. He had been digging into stuff for months and getting nowhere, then suddenly, he said he had this big breakthrough, some source he had. He left for Martinsburg, West Virginia to meet with his source that day. August 7th, Danny had shown his friend an outline for his book and said that he was getting frustrated with the current agent he had as he hadn't been able to sell it for the past year. August 8th, Danny went to pay the insurance policy on his house. He also checked into room 517 at the Sheridan Hotel in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Later that night, Danny told the man staying next door to his that he was waiting for an important source, someone that would give him groundbreaking information for his case. But, as the time came and went, nobody showed up, and Danny ended up staying in the bar for the rest of the night. The next day, Danny met with an informant in the parking lot of the hotel, assuming his room was bugged. The informant, Bill Turner, later said that he seemed happy and was smiling. Later that day, Danny went to the Stone Crab Inn and paid with a credit card. The bartender remembers thinking Danny looked lonely or introspective. After leaving the inn, Danny made a phone call to his mother's house, saying that he would probably be late for dinner, 
and not to wait for him. This wasn't unlike Danny's usual behavior, as he was sort of known to always be late or not show up to places. The last time anyone saw Danny Casolaro alive was that night at 10 p.m., walking back to his hotel with a cup of coffee he'd gotten from a nearby convenience store. The same day, back in Fairfax, Danny's housekeeper Olga claimed to have picked up five calls at Danny's house. The first at about 9 a.m., she claims to have heard a man on the phone say, I will cut his body and throw it to the sharks. Around half an hour later, another one saying drop dead. The rest of the calls that day, Olga remembers as either only radio music or silence. For the past few days, William Hamilton, the founder of Insla that met with Danny at the start of the video, had been trying to contact him and was starting to get worried. They would usually talk every few days, but it wasn't like Danny to ignore or not pick up Hamilton's calls. It wasn't just him though, the MSNBC reporter that Danny had talked to a few days earlier had also started getting worried. She dropped by his house in Fairfax, and finding that it was empty, left a note. Lo and behold, at 12.30pm the following day, August 10th, 1991, a maid at the Sheridan Hotel, where Danny was staying, pushed open the door to his room after receiving no response. Upon seeing blood on the floor, she called for the housekeeper of the hotel, Barbara Biddinger. Barbara, upon slowly pushing open the bathroom door, saw blood and blood only. From where she had opened the door, she couldn't really see the bathtub or what was in it, but upon cautiously creeping forward, she saw two white knees sticking out of the bathtub. This was enough for her to pull back. Within minutes, police and paramedics had arrived. But by the time they'd taken a quick look at the scene, it was pretty obvious, at least to them, that this was a suicide. His feet were facing the faucet, his wrists had been cut, and there were two empty plastic bags floating in the bathtub water. There was blood on the bathroom floor, the tile around the tub, and the toilet seat, but nowhere other than the bathroom. Upon lifting his body out of the tub, they found a beer can, a coaster, and a razor under him. There had even been a note written in pen, and while most sources disagree on what was exactly written, it was something along the lines of, To my loved ones, please forgive me, most especially my son, and be understanding. God will let me in. Looking around the hotel room, police found all of Casolaro's belongings intact, nothing to indicate someone had rummaged through the room. At this point, the police or paramedics didn't know who Danny was or what he was researching, and understandably so. But that meant when the body was taken to a funeral home and examined, they quickly established that Danny had died because of blood loss resulting from self-inflicted wounds. The body seemed to be in good health, other than the cuts that were on the man's wrists and except for a small bruise on his left arm, there were no obvious signs of struggle on his body. So, almost without a second thought, police and nurses considered the case closed, and that's why the undertaker at the funeral home, without receiving permission, embalmed the body. The practice of embalming usually involves removing all bodily fluids before injecting chemicals to try and preserve the body, but it also limits the accuracy of an autopsy. Not to mention that Danny's family weren't notified before the embalming which is illegal in West Virginia. In fact, at this point, Danny's family hadn't been notified at all that he was dead. It was only the following Monday, two days later, that Danny's brother Tony was informed of the loss. Apparently, the Martinsburg police had called the Fairfax police to notify the family, but for some reason, they just didn't. Nevertheless, upon hearing that his brother had died, Tony informed the police of his brother's research into the octopus case and asked if any of his papers or notes were in the hotel room. They weren't. He was also informed that they weren't going to do an autopsy because of the obvious cause of death. A little agitated because the police took so long to contact him, Tony called a medical examiner and demanded that an autopsy be done, at which point it was scheduled for the coming Wednesday, another two days. Tony was also surprised to hear that the undertaker had embalmed the body without notifying him at all, and as a doctor himself, Tony knew that this would impede the autopsy. Nevertheless, an autopsy was conducted on Danny's already embalmed body. The medical examiner confirmed that the cause of death was indeed blood loss from self-inflicted wounds, and that he didn't have any other bruises or contusions, other than the one on his right arm we mentioned earlier. The examiner doing this autopsy said that the bruise was several days old, and probably wasn't related to the death. They established that the time of death must have been just a few hours before he was found, as rigor mortis was just starting to set in. Something that was of particular curiosity though, was if there was any substances in Danny's blood. 
However, upon toxicology tests, only trace amounts of drugs were found. A little hydrocodone, probably from the Vicodin bottle that was found in his hotel room. Later, it was found that he'd been prescribed Vicodin for root canal pain a few years earlier. A little Tylenol was also found, as well as trace amounts of antidepressant. But it was concluded that nothing found in Danny's body was enough to incapacitate him, and certainly not enough to knock him unconscious. The autopsy also found that Danny had an undiagnosed case of multiple sclerosis, a chronic disease that affects the nervous system, so things like muscle weakness, tingling, and problems with coordination and balance. It's unknown whether he knew he had MS or not. Danny's suicide note was also sent to handwriting experts who confirmed it matches with other samples of Danny's handwriting. But upon realizing the results of the proper autopsy, articles, calls, and pretty much everyone who knew about the case were skeptical. Some even claimed to know where the killer or killers were. But it wasn't just random people who came up with their own theories. Knowledge about strange events had also started circulating at the time. Apparently, Danny had been researching the strange death of another man who died a few months earlier, and theories started emerging that their deaths might have been linked. Others theorized that maybe the undertaker that embalmed Danny's body did it on purpose as a CIA puppet. As many theories as there are, it'd be hard to go through all of them in this video, so let's focus on the arguments for and against Danny's suicide. While the arguments for suicide are obvious, Danny's body was found in a bathtub with apparent self-inflicted wounds and there was a note that matched Danny's handwriting. There were also no drugs in his system that would have incapacitated him. Some have even asserted that Danny's money problems might have had a role to play in his death. As we mentioned earlier, he was trying to sell parts of his land to make some more money, and his friends had even thought that this idea that he was going to publish a book about the octopus and get an advance from Time magazine was unrealistic. Maybe Danny had overcome his obsession with the octopus and realized that what he'd been working on for a year wasn't going to give him the fame and money he needed, and he became depressed. It's hard to think of an exact scenario. Some have said that maybe Danny knew that he had MS and that was enough for him to end his life. But while Danny did complain of things like numbness and pressure in his limbs, he never, in his life, mentioned multiple sclerosis to anyone, friends or family. It's likely that he didn't know about it, but does that make it more or less likely that it was a cause for his suicide? It's up for interpretation. Although the case for suicide seems pretty strong, there are segments of the story that can only support the case for murder. Throughout Danny's life and death, his family and friends all maintained the idea that Danny did not indicate in any way that he was thinking of suicide. They claimed that he was not exhibiting any behaviors that would make them think he was going to end his own life. One of which being the fact that he was still planning for the future. Danny was putting down payments on his house, and his notes revealed that he was even planning a summer barbecue cookout for his friends once the advance hit his account. If the issue plaguing his mind was financial, his family had stated already that they were willing to support him with money. It wasn't as if he had nowhere else to turn. Another piece of Danny's personality that was made clear by many of his friends was the strange way that Danny had decided to commit suicide. According to them, Danny hated the sight of blood, including his own. People close to him believed taking his own life in such a violent and bloody way was well out of the question for Danny. Another aspect of the supposed suicide is that Danny's arms showed no sign of what experts call hesitation marks, which are usually smaller marks that someone will make in hesitation before they take their own life. For Danny to commit immediately to taking his own life in this very bloody manner without any evidence of hesitation marks was something that struck those around him as odd. One of the most distinct pieces of evidence used by those who support the case for murder is the continuous anonymous phone calls Danny was getting in the days leading up to his death. These phone calls would usually be answered by his housekeeper, Olga, who was an older woman who spoke limited English. She had been Danny's housekeeper at his West Virginia home for nearly 10 years, and had developed a close caring relationship with Danny. Oftentimes, when Danny was not home, which these days had become more often than not due to his relentless chase of the story, she would answer any calls he received at his home and note any messages left for him. Although, on Friday, August 10th, Olga recalls receiving at least five anonymous phone calls at Danny's house. She states that the calls were all unsettling, ranging from anonymous men making direct threats on Danny's life to minutes of eerie silence. 
Danny's residence wasn't the only one receiving anonymous phone calls, as the Village Voice newspaper also states that on August 11th, the day after Danny was found dead, they received an anonymous tip to look into the disappearance of a reporter investigating the October surprise in West Virginia. Now, the nature of Danny's work was sensitive, as many of his colleagues and leads had told him that what he was investigating was dangerous. As mentioned earlier, Danny had begun looking into the dealings taking place at the Indio Reservation, an investigation that had taken lives in the past. Even five days before his death, Danny was warned by his colleague Rikonashuto that the information he was trying to look for would be dangerous to acquire. That's why, when Danny was found dead, one of the questions his brother asked when they found him was whether his notes were found in the hotel room. Sure enough, Danny's notes were missing, and even after searching Interstate 81 with a police dog, Danny's notes were never found. Many use this as another piece of evidence to back the murder claim, since even his wallet and all other belongings were found in the room. The only thing missing was arguably the most important thing, his work. In the aftermath of the case, as you can expect, several agencies and organizations were pushed to do an investigation about the death. The House Judiciary Committee, which had already started an investigation about the Inslaw case, then expanded their investigation to include Danny's death. The Martinsburg Police also reopened and conducted a more intensive investigation, as well as various West Virginia authorities. But two years after his death, a review of the Danny Casolaro affair was ordered, to see whether it was worth opening a federal investigation into the matter. The results of the review are as follows. Danny Casolaro committed suicide. There is no evidence suggesting that he was the victim of a homicide, nor is there any evidence of corruption or wrongdoing regarding the handling of his body or the autopsy. The report goes on to claim that Danny's life was deteriorating rapidly when he decided to end it. They agree that his financial situation alone couldn't be the sole reason, but his, quote, serious disabling and progressively worsening disease was. In fact, in the report, they put a lot of emphasis on the multiple sclerosis that Danny was found to have had, even though people who knew him say that it's unlikely he even knew about it. Their last claim is that, by trying to leave behind subtle clues that he may have been killed, Danny might have hoped to achieve the notoriety and fame that he couldn't when he was alive. Danny Casolaro's case has confused all who try to investigate it. From a life wrought with conspiracy to a death shrouded in mystery, Danny's life, death, and work are hopelessly entangled in one of the largest and most complex conspiracies in modern American history. <laughs>